You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. My name is Heather Haynes, and I'm a painter, and I sell paintings for a living. Heather Haynes is a Canadian artist who's lived and exhibited around the world. She's been creating since her teens, but her work took on a new purpose after a trip to the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was there that she witnessed such severe poverty and gender inequality, she vowed to use her art to tell these stories in hopes of affecting lasting change. Here's my chat with Heather Haynes. Who are you and what do you make for a living? My name is Heather Haynes and I'm a painter and I sell paintings for a living. So how'd you get started painting? Oh God. Well, you know, I was, all, I was always that kid who was into art. So that's what I was good at. Wasn't really good at anything else. Pr- pretty typical story as of artists. And um, my great or yeah, my great aunt, my grandmother's sister passed away when I was 16 and she left me all of her paints and brushes. So that's when I really started painting. I had a whole, you know, studio full of gold and acrylic paints and 30, 40 brushes. So that, that gave me my, my big start. Did she teach you how to paint? Is that, is that like something you guys shared? I I didn't spend a lot of time with that, um, that sister of my grandmother's, but, uh, just knowing she was an artist, you know, knowing she had a studio, she wasn't a professional artist. She was, you know, different generation, but, um, she had her own full studio in the basement. I thought that was very cool. So I was able to see what that looked like. And uh, yeah, just, just uh, no, she didn't teach me anything. No, I kind of <laughs> taught myself. <laughs> yeah. So basically through high school, you were, you were just kind of self-taught. You were learning and you were trying different things. Yeah. But then you went to school for it eventually, didn't you? Yeah, I went to McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Yes. And I loved it, actually. It was a four-year program, very small, started with 60 student, students in first year, and there was 14 of us by fourth year. So it was very uh, intimate. Um, the professors were awesome. They lived in Toronto. They were working artists, but then they commuted to Hamilton. So that was kind of cool because I came from a small, like, Kingston area, um, pretty white bread, not very creative, like, edgy. So, you know, they, were, they wore a lot of black. <laughs> <laughs> were there any berets? <laughs> no, they were too cool for that. <laughs> okay, fair. berets were out by then. <laughs> I think so. And so, how did yeah. you do? How did you find the program, and 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 how did the program find you? Because sometimes programs and artists do not mesh. Yeah, I I didn't really have um, a lot of guidance there to help me pick um, where I should go. I did have a portfolio, uh, and I I applied to a few universities. But uh, my sister went to McMaster, so I wanted to go to McMaster. She wasn't in art or anything, but I liked it. I went up there for, uh, you know, to tour it and had a really good party. Went to the downstairs, John, and that's where I wanted to go. (laughs) So I went there, (laughs) you know, but it really was, it's, it's about the, I like, I I felt very fortunate to um, just happen to meet these uh, profs that didn't even show us what they were doing. They just gave us the opportunity to create and tried not to influence us too much, just to guide us. And I think I think that was really important for me to develop my own style and my own uh, sense of who I was as an artist or what the work I wanted to produce. Well, and, and was it sort of a multidisciplinary program? Like, w- were you doing some, I don't know, sculpture work, some painting work, some other types of, you know, paper mache? That was always my favorite. Um, <laughs> did you, uh, did yeah, you do a bunch uh, yeah, of different you, stuff? Yeah, you took everything. Um, as and then you as the the later in years you got to choose so i really liked printmaking and sculpture painting i i loved painting I, and it came very easily to me but i i in school i enjoyed the other things more um i even learned to weld and i did a lot of performance art so i like my final year was about standing on my head in a tutu and army boots and like marching around and jumping like a frog, like right out there. But, uh, you know, it was like pushing the boundaries. And and I think I had a sense that in the real world, um, I wasn't sure how that would fit in. So it was just like really pushing my creativity. Yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine how a tutu wearing frog dancing around would actually wind up getting, for example, hung in a museum or in a gallery. You could probably get artist grants for things like that, but I am not an academic, so therefore I don't write artist grants. So I had to learn to make a living from my paintings. Well, tell me about how you started making a living from your paintings. So after university, I took two years off of 
making, creating art, uh, because I re- that transition from academic art to the real world for me, um, there needed some distance there because you have a lot of the voices of, you know, if it's pretty, then it's not worthy, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I made hats for two years and sold them at markets, moved out to Whistler for a while, sold and like learned about economics, sold at wholesale, how to like hustle. And um, so if I sold 10, 20 hats, I'd get, hustle and make 10, 20 more hats. And so, you know, it was just gave me this outlet to learn about the business and how, how to make a profit and how hard you had to work and hustle and sales and things like that. And I think that was really important. Um, then when I was 25, my boyfriend and I, who became my fiance, we bought a house and we both made the decision that I would start painting then right away because he had a job and we were poor anyway. <laughs> and I really had this feeling that if I was to get a real job, whatever that means, it would be very hard to give it up to follow my creative passion. So I thought, well, we're, f- we're doing fine. We don't have enough money to go anywhere or do anything. So why don't I just try now? And uh, that's how it started. It was just like, we were happy. Life was simple. And then we decided to have our kids right away as well to get them kind of out of the way. Yeah. Things were nice and simple. And so you decided to complicate them with small little yeah. screaming things. Well, <laughs> I, I, but I honestly, I had this idea that if I put 10 years in really hard, 10 years of creating my style and, um, even if my work wasn't good right now at 25, it, by the time I was 35, I was still young, but I'll have 10 years under my belt. And my work has to be fairly good by then. And that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> How did you start thinking like this? I mean, this is not normal artists talk. Artists normally are speaking a lot more creatively and a lot less practically. You have a plan. You knew you were looking 10 years out. You were, you were already yeah. uh, involved in, in, understanding finances you had a house you had you know debts you had a husband and now kids these aren't normally the choices of an artist and i'm curious why those cho- how those choices and how that type of thinking came into your being i think um I, a lot of it was instinct for me i think there's entrepreneurs in my family background so maybe there's a bit of that um and i also i listened to my high school teacher who was an art teacher who regretted not following his art. My profs who only got to be like one over five years and do the one year sabbatical to do their art. I saw the regret there. So I, I, so I learned from others taking that sort of safer route and thought, well, what do I have to lose? I'm 25 years old. If I give it a go now, you know, then I'll know. And it's not as much to risk. So I don't, I can't tell you that, but I, luckily it worked out. (laughs) (laughs) Was there a, 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 an inciting incident? Was there something, a big break? Was there a big sale that let you know you were on the right path, that you had made the right decision, kind of taking this air quotes risk at that time? Um, well, I, I would just, I started um, representing myself. So that was, you know, you, you, you can almost guarantee your successes if you price your work appropriately. So I wasn't feeling greedy. I felt like I would rather sell it put the money back in and make more work. I'm very prolific. I always have been like, I'm, you know, as I get hyped up, that's how I am when I paint. So I would get like, I'd have 40 paintings ready for a show or when my goal was 20, I'd have 40, that kind of thing or 40, 60. So it's important to sell them and get them, you know, passed on. And that that's, so I just, I started having shows uh, twice a year, one sort of in Kingston area and then in Toronto where my sisters lived and started building up my clientele that way. But then 10 years in, um, I was in Quebec City, walked into, uh, was looking at galleries with my husband, first time away, really. And uh, I, I struck up a conversation with one of the galleries and they were like, oh, are you an artist? I'm like, yeah. And they looked, they're like, do you have a website? I'm like, yeah, look at my, you know. <laughs> so then then we left and went to another gallery and I see her walk in. And I'm like, oh, maybe she's like, you know, finding the owners and going to sign me or something. And then we went to another gallery and then she runs out and that's what happened. And then they like, so it was the first time I started dealing with the gallery and then everything was starting to sell. And then I, so then I wrote another gallery in Toronto that I'd saw 
um, advertised in House and Home magazine. And I thought my work is it, that, that gallery looks similar to the gallery in Quebec that was doing really well with my work. Well, maybe if I reached out to them, then I could have these two galleries. That would be great. And I don't have to host my own shows and do that hustle. I was kind of tired of that. And they came, I was having a show in Toronto and they showed up and then they ended up buying all of my pieces for the next few years, like buying everything. And then they deal with galleries uh, across Canada, the US and UK. So yeah, that, that was a break. <laughs> is, that how, is that how things often work? Do galleries actually buy the artwork from you? Normally, isn't it they represent it, they hang it on their walls and they say, we're representing this artist. And if somebody happens to buy it, happens to walk in, they'll, they'll put on a show, they'll, they'll reach out to press, right? And they'll help yeah. you sell it, but they're not buying the stuff, right? No, that, that I had never heard of that. Um, they were, they were like a dealer. So almost like a wholesaler. So he had a gallery, but he also dealt with galleries and it was just his formula. And, uh, for sure I got burnt out after a while. I felt like I was prostituting myself, but I was really able to push myself to know what my limits were and what felt good, what didn't. And then I started pulling back. What was it that was feeling negative about it? I mean, were you, was it just that you were pumping out so much product and you thought, well, this is sort of diluting what I normally put into my pieces? I think my quality of work wasn't as good because the push was on. And then, and then there would be the asks for a similar painting, but in certain colors. And, and I knew I'd cry. I'd, I had jumped the shark when I remember saying to my young kids, like, mommy's just going to the studio to prostitute herself. <laughs> <laughs> I did. And I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe it's time for a shift. Luckily the market crashed in the States. So I didn't have to worry about that. Well, I mean, I think a lot of artists tend to wrestle with balancing their creative ideals and making money. And I think that everybody has to kind of answer for themselves what that happy place is. Because at a certain point, if you're just going to start taking requests, eventually it sort of becomes much more of a, I, I guess, a, a production job. Yeah, totally. I'm just going to ask you a little bit about what you're working on right now. Because I know you've taken a huge departure from your early years and there was, there was a pretty pivotal moment that put you on a path. Well, I think, you know, the prostitution leads to the next moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 2008, I was looking for something more from my art. You know, I explored that sort of commercial art. I felt like I had, you know, ex it, like gone as far as I wanted to and could go on that journey. Um, so I, in 2008, I went to Uganda. I volunteered for malaria prevention, to, but mostly it was just to go. I had been um, donating paintings to different causes in the last year. Three of them had been based on malaria prevention in Uganda, a women's training center in health center in Tanzania, and, and maybe maybe another something in Kenya. Um, so it was sort of swirling around. And then I had this opportunity to go. And at that time, I came home. Well, I was sort of asked this question, well, at the last day, like, what are you going to do? Like there was a bunch of us on this caravan or what are you going to do when you return to, to, you know, be part of something, be part of a change. You can see people are, are suffering and how are we, how are you going to be utilized? And I just like, I don't know, but I'm going to use my art. So then I came home and started creating paintings from that trip. And during that I created 40 paintings and I knew that that had shifted everything for me because these paintings felt different. And, and then I was able to have, have a show based on this. My, and, and the galleries weren't interested in this work at all. And I didn't really want them to be because I wanted, this was intimate. This was personal to me and I didn't want them being part of that. So I created the, that body of work. Uh, we went back, we actually sold our house, moved to our cottage. Um, my husband had given up his job a few years before to um, help with the kids. They were still young and helped me with the business. So we moved to the lake. We ended up traveling, going to Australia for a half a year, New Zealand. And then we went to Tanzania for two months as a family, the next, the following winter. And it was during that trip that, well, I knew I wanted to, to create more work, to say something with the work, to do something, to give a voice to those who had no voice and access. So use my privilege to do something, to say, to, to find that story and tell that story. And that's when I went um, to the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I read a book called A Thousand Sisters by the author Lisa Shannon. And it spoke about the women of the Congo and how terrible it is to be a woman, one of the worst places to be a woman. And I went with my friend who is a physician who we were staying with in Tanzania. And uh, 
we we kind of like found our way in <laughs> and uh were introduced to two women who were gracious enough to tell us their stories that were horrifying uh very brutal very disturbing and uh cracked me open and i then went home and created paintings based on this but went back with with my friend Karen um 11 months later and that's when things really changed for me um the tra- trajectory of my work and my purpose and my passion and my reason for the work that I'm doing to today so tell me about the work that you uh that you generated from these trips and that we were inspired by them so the first body of work um that I created after during after this trip was women of east africa so i'd now been to five countries in east africa so i was telling stories of the women from each country and i was looking for a space to show this body of work and that's how i ended up getting a gallery um in 2012 the the landlord of the space i talked to him and he said absolutely you can have the show there but i've been wanting to open up a gallery there and would you consider it and he did everything he could to help, like gave us free rent and um, what can you afford and made it really a possible. So then I had um, a, a space to show this work. So that was in Kingston, Ontario. And, and uh, I showed that body of work. This, so my second trip to the Congo, I had met a man um, on my last day. I thought I was interviewing a Rwandan woman, but I met this man. His name is Kazungu by chance. And we were both using the internet at a hotel and we striked up a conversation. Um, we shared emails and then he started emailing me, telling me, he said, you know, it's important what's happening to the women, but you know, what happens to the women of or to the children of those women. And so then he started educating me on all the children who had lost their mothers and how they're on the streets and there's no net for them. And he was looking after 16 orphans at the time. So 2013, I don't know if it was May or June, um, I during the Women of East Africa show, I decided I was going to help him to build a home for those 16 kids. He had been donated land. So I raised funds to build a home. And one year to the date we had met, January 10th, uh, the home was built, but the 16 children had turned to 80 children. Wow. So then I started painting those children. And my next show was The Children of the Congo, as I got two weeks before my show, I did, I realized I put the paintings out on the floor in a grid in like five, five, five. And I stood back and I realized I had to paint all 80. I couldn't sell them. It's going to take me years. And, but I was so overwhelmed with this is what I'm supposed to do. And I have no idea where it's going to lead me. So I, I, it took me three years in 2016. I finished it and I started touring it. And wherever I could, and and while I would show it, then it gave me an opportunity to, um, I put together a small documentary based on the concept, the projects behind, and uh, yeah, that's sort of been my my big pet project. That we've 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 moved a few times just in order to keep this this project moving forward because it without that is you know it's everything, and uh, we now support 140 orphans, a women's training center, a friend, and that I went back another time and a friend joined me and she started a women's training center. I was showing a section of the, the, it's called the wall of courage. Uh, in my gallery, I was showed a section of it during that three years and a man and his wife walked in and he asked what this was about. I told him and he, and he said, well, what's next? I said, well, we'd like to build a school because to educate the school fees are so expensive that if we use that money, we could pay teachers and we could educate hundreds more. So he built me that school. He's like, I'll build you that school. So this is, these are the projects that the art has inspired and given me a platform to reach people that want to be part of something. And this has been this grassroots level uh, project that we are able to, you know, do some amazing things through this man, Kazungu, who happens, like, he's the one, he's the guy who's making it all happen. I'm just telling the stories through my art. That is quite a story. I, and it's really interesting to hear. You don't normally hear of artists finding such direction, finding such purpose, and as well tackling such difficult issues. What has been the effect of all of this? I mean, both for you, your art, and for the kids. The effect of all of this 
has been the confirmation that we're here to do something to be used. If we're given a gift, we have, we have the ability to do something much greater than ourselves if we only had the courage to walk forward into it. And that's, that's the only difference that, between me and anyone else is that I actually had the courage to try and I, and I think as an artist, you know, we, we, we have a lot of di- um, disappointments and failures. And I, I certainly uh, struggled academically. So I was used to Fs. I was used to failing. So it wasn't always a negative. It was like this way to really develop my resilience and listen to the inner knowing that there is something I am meant to do that's big. And when I came upon the the wall of courage, I knew that that was it. I couldn't have told you that it would have uh, created all these projects behind it. I wouldn't have taken it on because it would have been way too much for me. I could not handle that. And and actually, I think knowing I can't handle it has been the reason everything's grown because I haven't resisted it. I haven't said I can't do that. I actually just leave space for whatever to happen and trust every like if the support will show up. Mm-hmm. Well, talk to me about the sport. Who who do you work with? Who takes care of things while you're generating work, generating ideas, and and putting shows together? Who who's helping you? Who's along the way and along for the ride? So my husband, like I said, he quit his job uh, 13 years ago and has been my studio assistant. He makes sure I'm I'm fed and watered <laughs> and <laughs> healthy, <laughs> like truthfully, because. Uh, I don't know. I think being an artist is a unique thing, and especially if you're driven and passionate. So he's he's amazing. And, uh, you know, the gender thing just is never... It's only been my issue, not his. He's, like, truly, that would be me thinking I needed to do more because I'm a woman. I should be better at these things. But I gave that up. That, you know, that that stupid conditioning. And uh, since I did that, it's just been this like great flow for us. And uh, that's what's needed to kind of take it to the next level. When I started the gallery, my sister was my partner. She's a jewelry maker, Whitney Haynes Designs. So she was along. She was very good at marketing and like working at the gallery and speaking to people. And she's this proud big sister. So that that was really helpful um, to build my my name locally. And uh, what about your kids? Are they involved? Oh, <laughs> Well, my kids, they've grown up around the arts. My husband is a musician too. So this is all they know. My oldest son, who's 24, he's turning 24, April 3rd. Uh, he is a painter as well. And he's finishing his final year at Concordia as a painting major and just had his own solo show in, Mon- in Montreal. How'd it go? And he's been sh- showing and selling since 16. It's great. Yeah, he's easy going. It's all like, there's no stress for him. Life is <laughs> awesome. The, uh, the, our youngest who's uh, 19, he's computer science. So he's the black sheep of our family, <laughs> the one with the brains. Um, just, you know, they're, they just great. They just go with the flow and have been to Africa numerous times. And, um, so we share that passion for travel. And then, uh, I have just in the last year and a half, uh, hired um, someone to help with marketing and Instagram social really get us on track and focus to how to take my work to the next level. What was going on that wasn't working that you now want to see more of? So we, we had the gallery for eight years, COVID hit and it was my studio and my studio and my gallery for the last year. So we decided, well, we actually bought another house that had space for a studio and we closed the gallery down and by closing the gallery down, it has freed up all of our focus to push the work further. And I also had, because we had made that move, I decided I'm going, like I would, I would had my marketable work that I could guarantee sales with, but I was full, I was diving in head first to my passion, which was my, my work based on the, the children and women of the Congo. And I g- did that. A year and a half ago, so before COVID, but I ended up uh, doing the artist project in Toronto. Did phenomenal there. It was amazing. It was well received. It was like, okay, this is I just I need to just get out to where my collectors are, my collector base, and uh, so we've been focusing, trying to focus on who that is, how to get in front of them, 
uh, I applied for um, some things and like I've got some something coming up that I can't really talk about yet that's really good. Uh, but I was also inter- invited to the United Talent Agency artist space as part of a group show to show the wall of courage during the pandemic. So I actually went out uh, September. I flew out for two weeks to LA in the middle of, they opened for like four weeks and it was our show and then they got shut down again. And that was phenomenal. Uh, Ayo Weiwei was one of the artists in the show. These ph- phenomenal artists were part of it. And I couldn't believe that I, I got to be um, included. And I had the largest piece because my paint, the, the Wall of Courage is 40 feet long by 12 feet high. It's massive installation. So because it's 80 paintings, they're two foot by three foot. So that's huge. You know, I'm so grateful to have had that opportunity in the middle of the pandemic. What that's done is encourage me to like make the best work I can. Like I'm, I'm now committed to the art fully and, you know, we have people helping to push the rest, but I, I need, it, it needs to start with the art, the art. I don't think I've pushed myself far enough with my art before. So despite the successes in terms of sales in the past, your calling now is to, is to, is to go art first and to let it dictate what you're going to be making and what you're going to be putting forth. Yeah, just be honest with it. Be truthful. Like, really push it a little further. Uh, I, I think with art, you're always afraid that, you know, something looks really good. But in order to get great, you have to risk the good disappearing. So I'm just going for it. And it's like, I've stepped into that. And uh, and I do. I feel like my work is, is every painting is getting better and better. I'm getting very clear on why I'm creating it. You know, a lot of this work lately is about equality for young, young girls. If we, if the world was created that women had equality, I do truly believe we wouldn't be in the shithole we're in. We wouldn't have the troubles we had. So if we were to put our attention on young girls now, tell them how important they are. And that, so some of my newer work is portraying these young Congolese girls as superheroes, as Batman, as Superman, as Flash. But these are young Congolese orphan girls represented this way. And imagine if they saw themselves that way, if young girls saw themselves that way. You you were given role models as superheroes. We were given role models as paper dolls and Barbies. This is not, you know, this isn't good for equality. You know, we need to empower young girls to see how strong and powerful they are inside. It lives in them but it gets, you know, squashed down. And I think the world is ready for it. Look at how much has bubbled up. It's amazing. You know, I knew I could feel with the pandemic that everything's going to shift. Things are bubbling up and it's phenomenal because we're then creating a space where we're talking about it. We're open to understanding it or we're getting pushed back, but that push isn't getting its way anymore. The voices are getting stronger and people are, understanding in a different way. So I think, and and I do believe that artists have such a crucial role in creating that narrative, uh, having that conversation, creating a feeling of empathy, compassion within a storyline, if it's a movie or if it's a, a art form or if it's music, these are the ways to sort of imprint an emotion on somebody that they can't shake off. In, in a time like, like this, I mean, as though there's any ever really been another time like this, but with the pandemic shutting so much down and shutting us away from each other so much, how are you finding like-minded people, interested, call them clients, buyers, or just admirers of your work uh, and your philosophy? How are, you, how are you getting in touch with these folks? Well, that's, you know, the work had to come first. So, and now I'm putting my work out there. And how are you putting it out? Well, social, social media, hired a publicist to, to start telling the story. Um, I had hoped that, you know, the, the work being at UTA might launch some things. So, at, and, and then asking people, you know, will you help champion this? And uh, do you have any recommendations? Like for the first time, I, re- I, you know, you would think I would figure this out by now, but networking is pretty key. <laughs> I think that's lost on a lot of people. I don't think that that's strange at all. I think a lot of people think I'm going to make this work in my, you know, little hovel because often you have to, you yeah. know, kind of shut yourself away in order to create. 
but then when you're ready to show it to somebody, you realize I've got nobody to show it to. Oh, I've yeah. got to go and find my people. I've got to go find people who are going to be interested in this. And it's hard to kind of do it staggered. And it kind of makes sense to just keep in touch. And keeping in touch yeah. is awfully hard during a pandemic and can be and can be awfully hollow over social media. So I find we're all right. kind of missing that in-person opportunity. I mean, there's something to see a piece of work on a screen. And then there's another thing to see a 40 foot by 12 foot piece on a wall. Yeah, I, but because I, all of my work has shifted so much right before the pandemic, I heart, I just made these great connections to put my work out there and then it shut down. So you, you know, that show in LA was very helpful and it gave me something to look forward to and then feed off of for a while. But I have, ha- it's been a struggle for the last little while to kind of like get your grounding and your gravity. Like, how do I work? Like, how do I move forward from here? You know, and then you find your patience and then you just get in front of the canvas and work it out that way. And then, you know, know that when things lift, I'll have a shitload of paintings ready. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, you know, I'm somewhere to show them. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I really don't know. <laughs> I'm with you. I feel the exact same way. Half the time I'm like, I'm just going to keep making stuff. And if, you know, hopefully some, the world comes back yeah. in some semblance of being it, able to see these things and experience them. And it's, this would be no different if it was my other commercial work, right? Like maybe like, so it's sort of, everyone is feeling the same. So you can't take it personally, although you do your ego, but in the end, it's just like, I'm doing what I love. That should be enough right now. That should be enough. And as long as I'm, you know, following these little bread trails and putting out lots of lines into the water, hopefully I'll catch some fish, but yeah, it's, it's taking a lot longer than you would want. Are you still of a mind at this point that you wouldn't sell the pieces separately? In other words, I know initially the idea was to put these, these, I believe it was 80 pieces uh, together and certainly to show them as a collection, but are they, are they meant to be dispersed? Are they meant to find 80 homes to spread the message? Yeah. Ideally, I always thought that they would, it would stick together and some big museum collector business would buy them. But when I was in LA, the curator who I, I admire greatly, Arthur Lewis, he sort of said, would you consider splitting them? And I respect him so much. I said, well, we can talk about it. And then we talked about the influence of the collector, how if those paintings were in these collectors' homes, then they all of a sudden were part of that family. And, you know, then they are, uh, then they have a stake in it. So yes, I, I have released them for sale. So they are for sale. That that only happened um, in the last few months. And I don't think I would have done it unless he had sort of spoke to me about that. And uh, as soon as he did, though, I'm like, yeah, I'm in. That's the way I'm supposed to do it. You know, it, it's it's like holding on to 100% of nothing. What's the point yeah. of that? You know, when you can... Yeah have a piece of actually something and uh you know you kind of have to make stuff but you also have to release it it has to be able to go out into the world for others to enjoy otherwise you're just painting for yourself or you're just writing for yourself or you're just dancing for yourself yeah and and, and the goal of the wall of courage is to to act for those kids so that i can raise funds and awareness for them so it took to sort of open up to that idea and say no it still can and maybe it will act in bigger better ways by releasing them because I, I'm done with trying to like drag them around the country <laughs> on my own. I am. I'm done. Like, and, and because of my work, I'm so proud of my new work that I can really, I can let that go and, and let them, you know, let it, let them play out. And, and now we're getting um, follow up stories of the kids that are on the wall who are now finishing high school. So then that becomes the next part of the story is how, you know, this influenced them, how, I, I have sponsors for the kids, how those sponsorships educated them, put them through school and gave them a foundation that they can now go on and live their lives. Like, you know, this is not, it will never end. The story continues. It just continues in different forms. It just started with the painting. Well, and speaking of continuing, what is your new work about? Where are you headed next? Well, I, I have to mention that we formed a nonprofit two years ago. So that was from people who were, wanting to help me take this to the next level or to, to put some, you know, structure into it. And it's called the art of courage. 
So theartofcourage.ca. And that's where we offer sponsorships to look after these kids, any kind of corporate sponsor, you know, whatever. And because it, it costs a lot of money to raise 140 children, if you can imagine, and run a school. And that is my obligation um, to do that. And uh, so that that's very helpful. I have these champions behind me who believe in me, like in the work. And that that that's amazing. So the net, so the work I'm working on is on the some, same subject. It's just the wall was heavy. I used, I actually told the children's story, their f- parents' stories of how they died if they were raped and murdered, and so the very heavy. It's very confronting. It's very emotional. People, if they see it the first time, can read like four of the canvases and then they're gutted. I knew when I did that, it was very uncomfortable for me too, but it had to be done. I had to honor that, those stories. Now I'm representing my subject matters as strong, as idols, as saints, as like, this is who we should be worshiping. You know, these are the most important people and we need to worship them. We need to be thinking about them because, you know, they're not sort of at the forefront. So that's my my feeling and and I'm just allowing my art to to lead me there and to find my voice and what I'm trying to say through my art and that's that's how I learn. I let the art lead me and then then I know why I'm doing it. Well Heather, where can people find out more about you? Well my website is heatherhaines.com and I'm Instagram Heather Haynes Artist, Facebook Heather Haynes Artist, you know, Google and your me. foundation. <laughs> My, uh, it's the nonprofit is the art of courage, artofcourage.ca. And we have a website there with lots of information and you can email it. It will be me or my husband. <laughs> we're pretty, it's, you know, self-driven and it's very small, but we're, we're doing some big work, important work. And, uh, the idea is to use art as a catalyst to create change. Well, Heather, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing with us how you make a living. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Subscribe to Making a Living Show on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more on the show, visit makingalivingshow.com and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Making a Living Show is produced by Next Exit Media and hosted by me, Roby Levy. Thanks for listening.